When was the last time you cried? Was it for the loss of a, a loved pet? Maybe even sad at the loss of a loved one or friend or family member? But have you ever cried or wept for your town or city? Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Glimpses of God. I'm in the city of Townsville, just been watching the sun rise from this beautiful vantage point, and it's just a, a great way to start the day. I've been attending something called a big camp and been really inspired by some of the speakers. And one of them was talking about the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet. He was a weeping prophet because of the message that he had to share about the impending destruction of God's people. He was a weeping prophet because of the rejection that he faced. No matter how hard he tried to reach his people, God's people, they just wouldn't listen to him. And the weeping prophet because his friends just wouldn't listen to him either. He was only about 17 when he was called to serve God. And what a burden that he had for God's people. So much compassion and empathy. How much empathy and compassion do you have for God's people? You know, we've got a burden to share the good news, to share the gospel with those around us. I don't know what it is, but growing up, um, there was a thing in, I suppose, my generation, my age, that, that somehow society drilled into our heads that men, grown men, don't cry. It's not, it's not like that. And certainly the British, you know, you don't cry, stiff up a lip. Just don't cry. Don't show your emotions. In fact, the, the, the revealing of, one emotion, of one's emotions in the British context used to be a sign of weakness. I remember I officiated at a wedding, how things have changed. And I was officiating at this wedding, and the, the groom, um, a big brother, used to lift weights. I mean, he was all man. And he was sat at the front waiting for his bride, which as you know, is prophetic of what is to happen in life. Some of you men know what I'm talking about. And he was sat there and he was looking nervous as it can be. And she was late as is prophetic. And I just gave him the thumbs up and then he just broke down and started to cry. And I'm not talking about a tear. I'm talking about... <laughs> I mean, this was full on cry. And his best man and others were coming to look for him, you know, and all that. And it was interesting, the, the, the reactions at the church. For the men, it was like, oh, please, man up. But the ladies, Oh. Oh. Anyway, he got his composure back together and then they announced the, you know, and the congregation stood as the bride came in. I mean, she looked great and brides do look good. But as he looked at her, he broke down again. And then she's coming up, he's just... <laughs> Now, I lost count of how many times he cried through the service. We got to the reception, and as is tradition, I'm sure it's the same here in Australia, there comes a point after all of the non-relevant speeches, you wait for the groom. And then he stood up to stay, to make his speech, and you know, you know, on behalf of my wife and I. And he did that. Then he broke down crying again. And at this point, I heard one of the women, because the women now had said, no, this is too much. And I heard one of the women on the table, it was a West Indian way, and I'll give the accent and then give a translation. She said, but him crying again? I think you've got that. Yeah, men aren't supposed to cry. Maybe attitudes are changing. Now we're, 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 we're getting in touch with our more feminine side as men. You know, the prophet Jeremiah, the author, and um, for our purposes, he is the author of Lamentation, has become one of my favorite biblical characters because he allows us to see what's going on in his heart, in his life. 
Jeremiah, and, and, and I've said it before, and this is why I love him, and he is the most transparent of prophets. And we often call him the weeping prophet. We can see his feelings, his thoughts, the turmoils of his mind. And as you read the book of Jeremiah, and indeed Lamentations, we see a man so totally absorbed in the message that God had given him to preach. And, and I, want you to, I want us to focus tonight on the fact that he cried for his people. And when we come to the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, I believe, is, an extremely, is extremely sad because, and understand this, he's just witnessed, he's lived through an invasion with the overthrow and the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem by the Babylonian armies. And Lamentations, this book, which we hardly ever turn to except when we want to prove something here and there from our theology, our systematic aspect of it, but Lamentations has been described as a funeral poem or a funeral dirge over the city the holy city of Jerusalem and Jeremiah was called by God to be a prophet as I said maybe from around the age of 18 and for decades Jeremiah had warned Judah he had warned Judah he was a he preached one message in effect with different kind of emphases or a different slant but his one message was he warned Judah that she was going to be destroyed unless she changed her spiritual habits became faithful to Yahweh God uh, but for all of Jeremiah's warnings all of his pleadings all of his min messages over death case he was ridiculed by the people he was rejected by government officials by the religious leaders the common people alike his messages were so unwelcome and we'll look at this tomorrow night the plots and threats were hatched against him to have him killed so unpopular was Jeremiah's message that he was imprisoned and nearly died when he was incarcerated in a disused well, Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah's message was near universally rejected. And in fact, Jeremiah cried for the lost state of his people. And if you have your Bibles or your holy devices and you look at Lamentations chapter 1 verse 1 and, and just feel the pain of the author as he's talking about the destruction of his city, of his land, of his people. He wrote, how lonely lies Jerusalem, once so full of people, once honored by the world. She's now like a widow. The noblest of cities has fallen into slavery. You see, Jeremiah's tears, understood, were not born merely for the loss of buildings, but the horrors inflicted upon the people as a result of the war. You see, we read the Bible and we say, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah and, you know, they went off into captivity. Lamentations, the author there tells us, let me give you an insight. He was nearly as a war correspondent. Let me tell you what happened when Nebuchadnezzar invaded. And so you read this in Lamentations chapter 4 verse 3 to 5. Lamentations chapter 5 verse 9 to 11. Here's what he said. He said, even a mother wolf will nurse her cubs. But my people are like ostriches. They're cruel to their young. Verse 4 of Lamentations 4. They let their babies die of hunger and thirst. Children are begging for food that no one will give them. I hope in your mind you're thinking modern day parallels. People who once ate the finest foods die starving in the streets. Those raised in luxury are pouring through garbage for food. Down to verse 9. He said those who died in the war were better off than those who died later, who slowly starved to death with no food to keep them alive. Verse 10, the disaster that came to my people brought horror. 2010, a new story, and I'm sure it came down here in Australia, you'd have seen it, it went viral across the globe. In 2010, in this country of millions, maybe I should say billion or whatever, the story was drawn to one person in this city of millions. 
And it centered on closed circuit television coverage of a market street in a city called Foshan in the Guodang province. And again, just to give a little context, Foshan, never heard of it. It's not in the top 20 cities, largest cities in China, but Foshan is larger than Changsha. It's about the size of London. And there was close circuit television coverage on one little aspect of a street. And I, I, I tried to watch it again today, but I couldn't. It's on YouTube. But a two-year-old girl had wandered away from her parents um, where they were working on one of the market stalls in one of the areas of this great city. And she wanders away and the closed circuit television shows her walking in the middle of this street. It's not a busy highway, it's, I would say it's a very quiet street, but it's in a busy area because it's right by the market. And as you're watching this, and every parent would know the horror, when your little toddler child wanders away from you near a street, it just instills a fear and you go into protect mode. And as I watched this, and I said I tried to watch it again today, but I couldn't. As a parent, you, you shout, you run after, you do everything to take your child away from danger. A van is approaching, not at any great speed, or so it appears. And there's this little child who's walking in the center of this little market, narrow street. And you think that the driver would see the child, but he knocks this little girl over. And again, natural reactions. When you hit something when you're driving, natural reaction, you stop, investigate. But that doesn't happen. He hits the little girl, she tumbles over, of course, and then he pulls away. But because of the way she's fallen, the rear wheels of the van go over her legs. And then this is the bit that got me. There are passers-by who are walking and they see this toddler child crumpled, bleeding in the middle of a road, a two-year-old. How do you not stop for a toddler? It gets worse. A few seconds later, another van approaches. Surely this second driver can see this little girl prostrate in the middle of the road. The driver runs over the girl a second time, does not stop. It gets worse. In total, they said about 18 people walked by or rode their bicycle. They saw the girl, they didn't stop to help. They looked on. They give you a whole different perspective to the parable of the Good Samaritan. They looked, they saw, they went on about their business. Miracle of miracles, at this point, the little girl was still alive, although unconscious. Her name, Wang Yu. Somebody did come after some time, scooped up that broken body and sought medical assistance. But despite the best efforts of the medical team, it was officially recorded that she died of systemic organ failure. Now this was, and still is to me, a sickening story of indifference and callousness to a child. And I remember when I watched this, and it was a big news story in the United Kingdom at the time, and I believe across the globe, and I felt so angry. How could people be so callous? I was angry 
to a point that I just wanted to let go or, or release my anger on someone. You don't do that to a child. And it was at that point that the spirit revealed into my heart and just said, Ian, many of us, many of you are as cold and as callous and as indifferent to those who are dying and bleeding all around us. The spirit said to me, you're angry at these folk in the city of Foshan, China, but what about your own people, your own self, your own church? You are passing by the bleeding and the dying and you don't care. Like Jeremiah ought to be crying for the loss of our country and bringing hope to them. But many of us don't even care that people are dying all around us as reflected, for example, in our prayer life, which largely is about me, myself and I. We pray so much about me, myself, and I. Jeremiah was crying for others. He was crying for the lost. And we should not simply be angry about the coldness and indifference of 18 people who did not assist a two-year-old child dying in the street when in our neighborhood, on our street, in our community, living right next door to us, there are people who are lost who are dying, who have not accepted the Lord as their savior, and we don't care. Hope you gain a blessing from that message. And let me just say a prayer to finish. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless us with your Holy Spirit. Touch our hearts. Let us be compassionate to the people around us. And Lord, we're so grateful for the love that you have for us, that we know that you're away preparing a place for us, that you'll come again one day. Help us to share that message with those around us. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. If you'd like to stay in touch, please subscribe. Hope to see you next time. Bye.